Hello, everyone. I'm Kamran. And I'm Billy. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors. Today, we will be discussing Book 2, Chapter 7 of Memories of Ice, a novel in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is Part 2 of our coverage of this chapter. And I'm sorry to say, it will not be a 12-parter, Billy. Only three. <laughs> it might happen. <laughs> One of these days. <laughs> as, as, as the books get longer and longer it's like oh my gosh i'm kind of afraid i hope it doesn't get that long but mm -hmm. oh goodness but this podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the malazan universe it's not a book review it's most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books just know that comrade and i know that this series is the best fantasy story ever written and we're approaching this from a purely fanboy point of view and that there will be no literary critique. We'll be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that haven't read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. A quick warning, today's episode contains descriptions of extreme, brutal, gruesome violence. It's not recommended for children. Our show is listener supported. If you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate it. You can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad-free episodes on Patreon Weekly. Also, we'd really like to hear from you. We really mean that. So send any feedback or comments that you have to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. All right, Chapter 7, Part 2. We pick up the chapter immediately following the timely appearance of Pran Cole and the Talan I Mass to assist the Grey Swords. The Grey Sword recruit's face was white. She sat on the ground, eyes unfocused, spattered with the blood of one or both of the soldiers who had given their lives protecting her. I'd like to reiterate how impressive the discipline is for these two that gave their lives to protect the recruit. The soldiers seem to be really bought into this organization's ideology. Boy, this really gives you a different outlook on these mercenaries. You know, in my mind, mercenary is always kind of an ugly word. And, you know, these fellows, given their life for a noob and a recruit like this, man, I mean, it says something. Yes. Definitely a testament to their training and the fact that they're following it uh, is pretty impressive. Yes. Idkovian stood beside her, saying nothing. He suspected the brutality of the engagement may well have broken her. Active service was intended to hone, not destroy. Idkovian's underestimation of the enemy had made of this young woman's future a world of ashes. The deaths would haunt her for the rest of her days, and there was nothing Idkovian could do or say to ease the pain. She said, Shield Anvil. He looked down at her, surprised that she would speak, wondering at the hardness of her voice. He said, Recruit? She looked around and studied the legions of Talani Mass who stood in ragged ranks, unmoving on all sides. She said, There are thousands. And that certainly would be an eerie sight to see so many motionless figures, really uncanny to be totally stationary like that. Yeah, kind of like weird, eerie sculptures. But let's go back to the, the thing about the recruit real quick. Even the Shield Anvil here expected her to not be in this good a shape mentally so something has happened here something's been born this is good i have some comments on that after we go through a couple more paragraphs here cool cool Idkovian thought spectral figures risen to stand above the plains tawny grasses row on row as if the earth herself had thrust them clear of her flesh he said i i judge well over ten thousand to land i mass tales of these warriors had reached us tales i found hard to countenance but this represents our first encounter, and a timely one at that. She asked, Do we return to Kapustan now? Idkovian shook his head and said, Not all of us, not immediately. There are more of these Kachain Shamal on these plains. Pran Cole, the unarmed one, some kind of high priest or shaman, has suggested a joint exercise, and I have approved. I will lead eight of the troop west. She said, Bait. He raised a brow and said, Correct. The Talani mass travel unseen, and will therefore surround us at all times. Were they to remain visible in this hunt, the Kachain Shamal would probably avoid them, at least until they have gathered in such numbers as to challenge the entire army. Better they were cut down in twos and threes. Recruit, I am attaching an escort of one soldier to you for an immediate return to Kapustan. A report must needs be made to the mortal sword. Accompanying the two of you, unseen, will be a select squad of Talani Mass. Emissaries, I have been assured that no Kachain Shamal are present between here and the city. She slowly rose and said, Sir, a single rider would do as well. You return me to Kapustan to spare me from what? From seeing Kachain Shamal cut to pieces by these Talani mass? Shield Anvil, there is no mercy or compassion in your decision. Itkovian stared out at the Talani mass and said, It seems you are not lost to us, after all. The boar of summer despises blind obedience. You will ride with us, sir. She said, Thank you, Shield Anvil. He said, Recruit, 
I trust you have not deluded yourself into believing that witnessing the destruction of Mor Kachin Shamal will silence the cries within you. Soldiers are issued armor for their flesh and bones, but they must fashion their own for their souls, piece by piece. I had that last sentence highlighted from a prior read through. I think it's incredibly well said. It is. It's incredibly well said. I agree. And I like their immediate respect for the, we thought we had lost you, sir. You relied with us, uh, <laughs> it's, you know, I, I really like that. You know, it's, that's really cool. One thing I just realized, there was a very heavy worship of the boar of summer within the Malazan ranks. And he just said, the boar of summer despises blind obedience. And it makes me curious if that way of thought is the way the Malazans think, because We've talked about if the, the leaders are not doing their job, they tended to get knives in their backs. Right, 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 right. That could just be that. That just could be how they work now. You know, welcome to the new Malazan military. Well, do you think that that had any influence on that way of thinking? The fact that they were worshiping the Boar of Summer, just like the Grey Swords, and the Shield Anvil saying that the Boar of Summer despises blind obedience. That could be. I could totally see how you'd have a lot of these warrior cults and how they've been forbidden supposedly but they're still kind of there i think you're right there's a lot of where this came from is this uh does it like the blind obedience so yeah just kind of buck up a little or or it could be uh and something uh and i'll reference to here in a moment again to a different uh, uh, the full metal jacket reference to, to think about like the marines when he talks about you know they don't they don't want automatons they want you know they want mind they don't want mindless killers they want you know people that can think for themselves that are killers <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite like that but that's kind of the paraphrase but it's uh yeah the recruit looked down at the blood spattered across her uniform and said it has begun. And this is in response to fashioning the armor for their souls. This is showing me that this is a pretty tough individual right here. This is the kind of portrayal of a strong female character that I appreciate. Agreed. I appreciate this very much. And in the immortal words of the late great Arlie Army from Full Metal Jacket, she was definitely born again hard. <laughs> In this land, in the, uh, <laughs> one of the greatest yeah. on film drill instructors ever, followed by the one that was in Starship Troopers, of course. Oh, it was Clancy Brown. It's Clancy Brown. Clancy Brown's the guy's name. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Then there was this isn't a drill sergeant, but the sergeant in Aliens. That guy was awesome, too. Oh, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for giving me this because I've just needed any excuse to just start watching Alien anytime. And it's just like, you know what? I can do that series anytime, anywhere. I don't know why, but apparently Prometheus and Covenant are kind of divisive. I love those movies dearly. Mm -hmm. Prometheus does something that this that it's it's akin to what Alien does, but even more so. It's it's a beautiful, gorgeous sci-fi movie that makes you fall in love with science fiction movies and then it just goes all hardcore. <laughs> It comes real brutal, and you're like, wow, this is really horrific, you know? Yeah. Ikovian was silent for a moment, studying her. He said, The Kappen are a foolish people to deny freedom to their women. The truth of that is before me. She shrugged and said, I am not unique. Taking us back to who the Grey Swords were allowed to recruit from, since the second and third born daughters of Kappen families are cast into the streets, I believe we are seeing the product of someone that has gone through that and has had to find any means necessary to survive. Yeah, I agree, but imagine the loyalty she must now feel that she has survived this and come through after these two people have laid down, their guardians have laid down her life. I think if, if they'll do this for a recruit, what will they do for you if you become a full-fledged initiate? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't even know if she's had time to process that yet. This is the immediate aftermath, yeah. so she's gonna need some time to think about everything. Yes. She, oh, she might yeah. be thinking about it, but I would think it would take some time. Yeah, it would. But yeah, to your point, that's the kind of stuff that when you've had a tough life and you're given an opportunity to do something special, you probably take it. And then seeing the caliber of the people that she's joined, I would think that would be desirable, given the alternative. Yeah, absolutely. Itkovian said, attend to your horse, soldier, and direct Sidless to join me. The recruit said, sir. He watched her walk towards the waiting horses and the surviving soldiers of the wings, all of whom had gathered around their mounts to check girth straps, fittings, and equipment. She joined their ranks, spoke with Sidlis, who nodded and approached Ikovian. Pran Cole strode up at the same time. He said, Ikovian, our choices have been made. Kron's emissaries have been assembled and await your messenger. Ikovian said, understood. Sidlis arrived and asked, Kapustan shield anvil? Itkovian said, with an unseen escort, report directly to the mortal sword and the destriant. 
in private. The Talani mass emissaries are to speak with the Grey Swords and no one other, for the moment at least. She said, Sir. Pran Cole said, Mortals, Kron has commanded that I inform you of certain details. These Kachain Shamal are what was once known as Kael Hunters, chosen children of a matriarch bred to battle. However, they are undead, and that which controls them hides well its identity. Somewhere to the south, we believe. The Kel hunters were freed from tombs situated in the place of the rent, called Morn. We do not know if present maps of this land mass know the place by these ancient names. Ikovian nodded and said, Morn, south of the Lamatath Plain, on the west coast and directly north of the island wherein dwell the Segula. Our company is from Elengarth, which borders the Lamatath Plain to the east. While we know of no one who has visited Morn, the name has been copied from the oldest maps and so remains. The general understanding is that nothing is there, nothing at all. Prankol shrugged and said, The barrows are much worn down, I would imagine. It has been a long time since we last visited the Rent. The Kael hunters may well be under the command of their matriarch, for we believe she has finally worked her way free of her own imprisonment. This, then, is the enemy you face. Ah, so we finally find out what escaped from the barrow that Tok climbed earlier in the book when he arrived in Morn. If you remember, there was a huge central barrow with that hole that looked like something had ruptured out of it and scrabbled its way out. Yes. So these horrors, Mama has just come out to play. This is not good. <laughs> Imagine how bad she must be if these are just her youngins. That's a good question because if you're interpreting this like a ant colony, when you have something like a matriarch and all these drones, is the queen generally stronger than the warrior ants that protect her? I don't think so. I don't think so, but this thing breeds things to protect it. What else is it going to breed? Yeah, the question is, can undead breed? Right, well, she's doing some. <laughs> Something's going on. That's all we know. These are some good questions. I have the alien resurrection <laughs> imagery going on with all this stuff. I, it's a Queen Mother episode, if there ever was one, where it breeds that even nastier human hybrid. You, you remember that one? Beautiful, beautiful butterfly. Beautiful. Yes. Oh, my word. That is such a horrific <laughs> flick. I love that one. And it's just... I have a soft spot in my heart for that alien. I think it's one of my favorite ones. <laughs> I don't know why I do, too, but I do. It is. It's probably because it's a daggum morbid, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> the scene where the aliens were swimming under the water, that was really cool. Ooh. Really well done scene. I think that's the first time we ever saw them underwater swimming. Mm -hmm. And they're just as deadly there as they are on land. How is this the second time we're talking about aliens? <laughs> it's, not, it's not going away. It's not going away. Because I, every, time, every time I think of the Kachin Jamal, dude, that's all I think about is alien. I can't break it. I told you that from last time. I said, yes, they're a little bit more dinosaurish now in my brain, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, that doesn't take too much of an alteration in my brain. It's like, okay, that's even worse because now they're like alien plus dinosaur. It's in my brain is my problem. And so I'm like, oh, this is not good. <laughs> Those things lay a lot of eggs and they take over planets like very easily, apparently. <laughs> it's like, this is not good. Right. Frowning, Itkovian shook his head and said, The threat from the south comes from an empire called the Panyan Daman, ruled by the seer, a mortal man. The reports of these Kachain Chamal are recent developments, whilst the expansion of the Panyan Daman has been underway for some years now. He drew breath to say more, then fell silent, realizing that over 10,000 withered, undead faces were now turned towards him. <laughs> his mouth dried to parchment, his heart suddenly pounding. Pran Cole rasped, Itkovian. This word, panion, has it a particular meaning among the natives? Itkovian shook his head, not trusting himself to speak. Pran Cole said, panion, a jagoot word, a jagoot name. The plot thickens. The amount of convergence happening in this book is just ridiculous at this point. Agreed. And shall we just kind of do a recapitulation here to say, Rake, Brood, and the Tist and A, and Brood's forces, Caller whatever his current abilities may be, he seems to keep these other ascendants on their toes too. So he's obviously of some power level. That's just like next level. You got Dujack, Whiskey Jack and company. We don't even see much of them yet. We barely see them. It's too busy dealing with all these other higher level fellows. You got the Kachain Shamala and their mama and whatever other horrors that remain to be seen coming <laughs> from her end. Mm -hmm. Not a pun intended either. Um, Talani Mass and Silver Fox Greyhounds in the Cap'n situation, Grunling Company with the ever questionable Bajalani Coral Roach, 
Am I missing anyone? Lady Envy. Oh, my word. And the Segula with their punitive force or whatever it's called. <laughs> the punitive force. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that group with Todd and also one of my favorite, Talani Mast. It's like, my word. Have we seen all these folks in one connection? When you just listed it all out like that, yeah. it made it real because it is so many things <laughs> coming together at once. We thought we saw some of this in Dead House Gates, but no. this is a whole nother level. And I'll make a reference oh, to something the bar guest. later on. Oh, thank you. The bar guest. Yes. They're trying to recruit the bar guest too. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. What's his face? Is, what's it? Trots is supposed to negotiate a, a, some kind of deal with them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's even another layer on this cake. Yeah. My yeah. God, that's crazy. <laughs> and we're what, chapter what? Seven? <laughs> Seven. Seven of 24. <laughs> Not even a third of the way through the book yet. And I'm going to say something here, and it's going to kind of spoil something I'm going to say later on, but it, I'm, I'll re-say it later on too. And I'll, it doesn't, uh, doesn't ruin anything. You had to read the first two books just to get your head wrapped around that to be ready for something like this yeah i feel sorry for anybody that tries to jump into this series in the middle anywhere dude yeah the only place you could safely do so midnight tides yeah midnight tides is almost like a a net new storyline that's touching some other things i remember the first time i was reading through the 10 books the departure from the stories and the people that we were used to hearing about mm. was a little bit jarring for me, but in the subsequent times I've read it since then, it's actually grown on me quite a bit. It does. It grows on you because it's, it's fantastic. But when I first read it, I'm like you, it's like, I had nothing to, it's like, it just so throws you at them. It's just like, when it's like starting over. <laughs> it's like, wait, what? Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. who? <laughs> I don't know any of you fellas. I don't know anybody. And I mean anybody. Well, there is one character that carries over. I don't want right. to jump too right. far into that. No, no, no. That's our bridge. Yeah. We go to Talk, who sat by the fire, his lone eye studying Bale Jag, who slept at his side. He thought, what had Tool called her? An A. Her face was longer and narrower than the Timberwolves Talk recalled seeing in Black Dog Forest, hundreds of leagues to the north. At the shoulder, the creature beside him had two, maybe three hands on those northern wolves. Sloping brow, small ears, with canines to challenge those of a lion or a plains bear. Broadly muscled, her build suggesting both speed and endurance. A swift kill or a league-devouring pursuit. Balejag looked capable of both. The wolf opened one eye to look upon him. I feel like there was a missed opportunity with describing Balejag's eyebrows here. I always crack up with our huskies. Their eyebrows are so expressive. You can always tell... They're like, oh, God, am I in trouble? Or they're, they're <laughs> kind of looking around, furrowed brow. It's very right. expressive. Yeah, that would be funny if it had gone that way. And you're right. It's a missed opportunity. No criticism. I'm just saying. Yeah. It would have been funny. Talk murmured, you're supposed to be extinct, vanished from the world for 100,000 years. What are you doing here? She was his only company for the moment. Lady Envy had elected to make a detour through her warren northwestward 120 leagues to the city of Callows to replenish her supplies. He thought, supplies of what? Bath oil? He was unconvinced of the justification, but even his suspicious nature yielded him no clue as to her real reasons. She had taken the dog Gareth with her, as well as Mock. Reminder, Mock is the highest ranking of the three Segula. I know the names can be a little bit confusing who's who. So I just thought I might mention that. Yeah, she has enough backup then. She doesn't need any backup, man. No, she doesn't. I think we've but seen that. If, <laughs> I think we've seen that too. But yeah, backup's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah. Talk thought, safe enough to leave Senu and Thirul, I suppose. Tool dropped them both after all. Still, what was important enough to make Envy break her own rule of a minimum of three servants? Tool had vanished a half bell earlier, off on another hunt. The remaining two Segula weren't in a generous mood, not deigning to engage talk in conversation. They stood off to one side. He thought, watching the sunset, relaxing at attention? He wondered what was happening far to the north. Dujek had chosen to march on the Panion Daman, a new war against an unknown foe. One Arm's host was Talk's family, or at least what passed for a family for a child born to an army. The only world he knew, after all. What kind of war were they heading into? Vast sweeping battles are the crawling pace of contested forests, jagged ranges, and sieges. 
He fought back another surge of impatience, a tide that had been building within him day after day on this endless plain, building and threatening to escape the barriers he'd raised in his mind. He thought, damn you, Hairlock, for sending me so far away. All right, so that Warren was chaotic. So was the puppet that used it on me. But why did it spit me out at Morn? And where did all those months go anyway? He had begun to mistrust his belief in happenstance, and the crumbling of that belief left him feeling on shaky ground. As I imagine it would be. If you begin to lose faith in the idea that everything is chance, and there may be larger forces acting on you and everything around you, then it would be a monumental shift in your perception of the world. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Monumental is the correct word. Would you say existential, sir? This could be an existential crisis for this man, yes. <laughs> Does this lead to some fin de siècle de ennui? I'm not sure, but... <laughs> No, we'll leave that to Crocus. <laughs> the ennui. <laughs> Talk thought. To mourn and its wounded Warren. To mourn, where a renegade Talani mass lay in the black dust. Waiting, not for me, he said, but for Lady Envy. Not any old renegade Talani mass either. One I've met before. The only one I've met before. And then there's Lady Envy herself and her damned Segula servants and four-legged companions. Anyway, now we're traveling together. North to where each of us wants to be. What luck! What happy coincidence! Talk disliked the notion of being used, of being manipulated. He'd seen what that had cost his friend, Captain Perrin. He thought, Perrin was tougher than me. I saw that from the start. He'd take the hits, blink, then just keep going. He'd some kind of hidden armor, something inside him that kept him sane. Not me, alas. Things get tough, and I'm liable to curl up and start whimpering. I find Talk's perception of Perrin interesting. We know that internally, Perrin is being eaten alive with what's being foisted on him, but Talk doesn't see it. Maybe this perception was formed at a point in time where Perrin was handling everything back when Talk knew him, and in the time since, Perrin has begun to collapse as more and more has been put on his plate. What do you think? There's a lot of things that we also have to be re remember here is that Talk wasn't really around Perrin all that long before he got whisked away to where he was, and we thought he was gone two books ago. And it's kind of like, wait, where did he go? And now that he's back, he doesn't, you know, he has, doesn't know anything about the Master of the Deck stuff or this Hound's Blood encounter stuff, the stuff that happened inside the sword. Perrin has been deeply altered since the last time Tok saw him. Good point. Tok glanced over at the two Segula. It seemed they were as loath to talk to each other as they were to anyone else. He thought, strong, silent types. I hate those. I didn't before. I do now. So, here I am, in the middle of nowhere, and the only truly sane creature in my company is an extinct wolf. His gaze returned once more to Baljag. He softly asked, and where's your family, beastie? The answer came, a sudden explosion of swirling colors directly behind the socket of his lost eye. Colors that settled into an image. Kin assailing three musk oxen. Hunters and hunted, mired deep in mud, trapped, doomed to die. The point of view was low, from just beyond the sinkhole, circling, ever circling. Whimpering filled Tok's mind, desperate love unanswered, panic filling the cold air. A pup's confusion, fleeing, wandering mudflats and sandbanks across a dying sea. Hunger. Then standing before her, a figure, cowled, swathed in roughly woven black wool, a hand wrapped in leather straps, down to the very fingers, reaching out. Warmth, welcome, a palpable compassion, a single touch to the creature's lowered forehead, the touch, Tok realized, of an elder god. And a voice, you are the last now, the very last, and there will be need for you in time. Thus I promise that I shall bring to you a lost spirit, torn from its flesh, a suitable one, of course. For that reason, my search may be a long one. Patience, little one, and in the meantime, this gift. The pup closed her eyes, sank into instant sleep, and found herself no longer alone, loping across vast tundras in the company of her own kind, an eternity of loving dreams, secured with joy, a gift made bitter only by waking hours, waking years, centuries, millennia spent alone. Baljag, unchallenged among the dream world's A, ruling mother of countless children in a timeless land. No lack of quarry, no lean times, upright figures on distant horizons, seen but rarely and never approached. Cousins to come across every now and then. Forest-dwelling Agcor, White Bendal, yellow-haired Atog of the far south, names that had sunk their meaning into Balejag's immortal mind. Eternal whisperings from those A that had joined the Talani Mass, there, then, at the time of the gathering. A whole other kind of immortality. Balejag's eyes had seen more of the world than could be fathomed. 
Finally, however, the gift had come. The torn soul delivered to her own, where they merged, eventually became one. And in this, yet another layer of loss and pain. The beast now sought something. Something like redress. Talk thought, what do you ask of me, wolf? No, not of me. You ask not of me, do you? You ask of my companion, the undead warrior, Onos Tulan. It was him you awaited whilst you shared company with Lady Envy. And Gareth? Ah, another mystery for another time. And yes, I really want to know more about Gareth. By all accounts, he's the size of a hound of shadow. Yeah, and I would really like to know about this fella. I'd like to know about both of them. They're very intrigued. We're getting a little bit more about Baljag here. Quite a bit more, actually. Yeah. But Gareth always seems to escape me. <laughs> I don't know if I'm forgetting if we ever get that information. I'm not sure either, but he doesn't seem to be the focus of much talk as much as Baljag is. Another thing I just realized reading that passage, the scene that talk is witnessing with the pup circling around the family mm -hmm. that's all trapped in the mud. Mm -hmm. Didn't we see that at the beginning of the book? Yes. In the prologue? I believe this is it, yeah. Do you think that was the exact same scene? Yes, I believe it is. That makes sense. And you know who's talking to him, right? The, you know who the god is. I assume it's cruel. It is. I know that only because I do audio as I read, and you know, Mr. Lister does the voices so well, and he always does it in the same, I don't know, kind of Bella Lugosi, Vincent Price combination voice. <laughs> He does for his cruel voice. So yeah, he doesn't that. So th that is spoken in the same way. I'm like, I'm assuming that's, I don't like you. I was assuming that's cruel and that that's verified through the audio listening. Makes sense. It does. Talk blinked, his head jerking back as the link snapped. Balejag slept at his side, dazed, trembling. He looked around in the gloom. A dozen paces away, Tool stood facing him, a brace of hairs dangling from one shoulder. Talk thought, oh, bear roof end. See? Soft inside. Far too soft for this world and its layered histories, its endless tragedies. With a raspy voice, Talk asked, What? What is it this wolf wants of you, Talani Mass? Tool cocked his head and said, An end to her loneliness, mortal. Talk asked, Have you... Have you given answer? Tool turned away, dropping the hairs to the ground. His voice when he spoke shocked Talk with its raw mournfulness. He said, I can do nothing for her. The cold, lifeless tone was gone, and for the first time, Tok saw something of what hid behind that deathly, desiccated visage. Tok said, I've never heard you speak in pain before, Tool. I didn't think. Tool said, you heard wrong. His tone once again devoid of inflection. He asked, have you completed the fletching for your arrows, Tok the Younger? Tok said, aye, like you showed me. They're done. Twelve of the ugliest looking arrows I've ever had the pleasure of owning. Thank you, Tool. It's outrageous, but I am proud to own them. Tool shrugged and said, they will serve you well. Talk said, I hope you're right. I'll do the meal then. Tool said, that is Senu's task. Talk squinted at Tool and said, not you as well. They're Segula, Tool, not servants. While Lady Envy isn't here, I will treat them as traveling companions and be honored by their company. He glanced over to find the two warriors staring at him. He said, even if they won't talk to me. He took the hairs from Tool and crouched down beside the hearth. He began skinning the creatures and said, tell me, Tool, when you're out there hunting, any sign of other travelers? Are we completely alone on this Lamatath plain? Tool said, I have seen no evidence of traitors or other humans, talked the younger. Veteran herds, antelope, wolves, coyotes, fox, hares, and the occasional plains bear. Birds of prey and birds that scavenge. Various snakes, lizards, talk muttered. A veritable menagerie. <laughs> then how is it that every time I scan the horizons, I see nothing? Nothing. No beasts, no birds even. Tool said, the plane is vast. Also, there are the effects of the Talon Warren which surrounds me, though that is much weakened at the moment. Someone has drawn on my life force, almost to exhaustion. Ask me no questions regarding this. My Talon powers nonetheless discourage mortal beasts. Creatures are given to avoidance when able. We are, however, being trailed by a pack of A-Tog, yellow-haired wolves, but they yet remain shy. Curiosity may overcome that eventually. Talk's gaze returned to Baljag. He said, ancient memories. Tool said, memories of ice. Ooh. I knew you'd be excited by that. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like Peter Griffin. It's always like, <laughs> <laughs> Tool said, by this in your earlier words, I concluded that something has occurred. A binding of souls between you and the A. How? Talk said, I'm not aware of any binding of souls. I was granted visions. We shared remembrances, I think. How? I don't know. There were emotions within it, Tool. Enough to make one despair. Tool said, every gift is edged. Talk grimaced as he gutted the animal. He said, edged. I suppose so. I'm beginning to suspect the truth of the legends. Lose an eye to receive the gift of true vision. Tool asked, 
How did you lose your eye? Talk the younger. Talk said, a sizzling chunk from Moonspawn, that deathly rain when the enfilade was in full swing. Tool said, stone. Talk nodded and said, stone. Then he stopped and looked up. Tool said, obelisk. In the ancient deck of holds, it was known as Menhir. Touched by stone, mortal. Chenre Aral Lich Fail. There on your brow. I give you a new name. Aral Fail. Talk said, I don't recall asking for a new name, Tool. Tool said, names are not for the asking, mortal. Names are earned. I had that highlighted. <laughs> yeah, so did I. <laughs> Talk said, huh, sounds like the bridge burners. And like you and I have just said, very excited to see this line. Yes. I absolutely love it. It's probably why I like the bridge burners also. Yes. We don't know a lot about how they get their names yet. Yeah. We'll learn about that later <laughs> in the book, but it's a similar type scenario. Yes. Tool said, in ancient tradition, Errol fail. Talk thought Hood's breath. He snapped, fine. Only I can't see that I've earned anything. Tool said, you were sent into a warren of chaos, mortal. You survived, in itself an unlikely event, and traveled the slow vortex towards the rent. Then, when Morn's portal should have taken you, it instead cast you out. Stone has taken one of your eyes, and the A here has chosen you in the sharing of her soul. Balejag has seen in you a rare worthiness, Errol Fail. Talk said, I still don't want any new names. Hood's breath. He was sweating beneath his armor. He searched desperately for a way to change the subject, to shift the conversation away from himself. He asked, what's yours mean anyway? Ono's Tool Lan. What's that from? Tool said, Ono's is clanless man. T is broken. Ul is veined, while Lan is flint. And in combination, Tool Lan is flawed flint. Talk stared at Tool for a long moment. He repeated, flawed flint. Tool said, there are layers of meaning. Talk said, I'd guessed. Tool said, from a single core are struck blades, each finding its own use. If veins or knots of crystals lie hidden within the heart of the core, the shaping of the blades cannot be predicted. Each blow to the core breaks off useless pieces. Hinge fractured, step fractured, useless. Thus it was with the family in which I was born. Struck wrong, each and all. Talk said, Tool, I see no flaws in you. Tool said, in pure flint all the sands are aligned. All face in the same direction. There is unity of purpose. The hand that shapes such flint can be confident. I was of Tarad's clan. Tarad's reliance in me was misplaced. Tarad's clan no longer exists. At the gathering, Logros was chosen to command the clans native to the First Empire. He had the expectation that my sister, a bonecaster, would be counted among his servants. She defied the ritual, and so the Logros Talan I mass were weakened. The First Empire fell. My two brothers, Tabur Tindara and Han Ith Lath, led hunters to the north and never returned. They too failed. I was chosen first sword, yet I have abandoned Logros to Lanai Mass. I travel alone, Errol Fail, and thus am committing the greatest crime known among my people. Talk said, wait a moment. You said you're heading to a second gathering. You're returning to your people. Tool did not respond, head slowly turning to gaze northward. Balejag rose, stretched, then padded to Tool's side. She sat, matching Tool's silent regard. A sudden chill whispered through Talk the Younger. He thought, Hood's breath. What are we headed into? He glanced at Senu and Thirul. The Segalus seemed to be watching him. He said, hungry, I gather. I see your bridling impatience. If you like, I could. Talk was suddenly elsewhere, seeing through a beast's eyes, but not the A, not this time. And not images from long ago, but from this moment, behind which tumbled a cascade of memories. A moment later, all sense of himself was swallowed. His identity swept away before the storm of another creature's thoughts. He felt rage cold, deadly, unhuman. He thought, it has been so long since life found shape, with words, with awareness, and now too late. Muscles twitched, leaked blood from beneath his slashed, torn hide. So much blood soaking the ground under his flesh, smearing the grasses in a crawling track up the hill's slope. He thought, crawling, a journey of return, to find oneself now at the very end, and memories awakened. The final days so long ago now had been chaotic. The ritual had unraveled unexpectedly, unpredictably. Madness gripped the soul taken, splintered the more powerful of its kin, broke one into many, the burgeoning power wild, blood hungry, birthing divers. The empire was tearing itself apart, but that was long ago, so very long ago. And this is the empire that Hebrick, Felicin, and Culp came across in Seven Cities. The people were frozen mid-transformation. Yeah, this is awesome. He thought, I am Treach, one of many names. Trake, the Tiger of Summer, the Talons of War, Silent Hunter, 
I was there at the end, one of the few survivors once the Talani mass were done with us. Brutal, merciful slaughter. They had no choice. I see that now. Though none of us were prepared to forgive. Not then. The wounds were too fresh. Gods, we tore a war into pieces on that distant continent, turned the Eastlands into molten stone that cooled and became something that defied sorcery. And that would be Odotaro Island, east of Seven Cities. I wonder what Warren was shattered. I know it. I'm real curious about that. And what I was going to say a second ago is on a previous call, I had alluded to this enormous info drop. All of this stuff just kind of casually thrown in there just by these two sentences is like, wow. And we just got the birth of Auditorial and the death of the supposed first empire and the birth of divers. Yeah. There's a dense section right here. <laughs> oh my word. Yes. I love it. We're not done yet. It, we got like three it. more paragraphs of this stuff. Yeah. I know it. I know it. <laughs> the thoughts continued. We fled a handful of survivors. Rill and Daris, old friend. We fell out, clashed, then clashed again on another continent. He had gone the farthest, found a way to control the gifts. Soul taken and divers both. White Jackal, Atog, Agcor, and my other companion, Mesrem. Where has he gone? A kind soul, twisted by madness, yet so loyal, ever loyal. Both Rillandaris and Mesrem were in Dead House Gase. Yeah. R.I.P. Mesrem. Yeah, I liked Mesrem, and I didn't realize he's so ancient. But something that just popped into my brain on this read when you just said that to me. Is Rillandaris capable of both? Is he a soul taken and a divers? That's what it sounds like. Sounds like he got mastery over being able to be singular or both. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So he could be a white jackal or whatever this egg thing is. Maybe a wolf or something. I don't know. Yeah. No idea. Maybe whatever he wants to be anymore. The thoughts went on. Ascending, fierce arrival, the first heroes, dark, savage. I remember a vast sweep of grasses beneath a sky deepening to dusk. A wolf, its single eye like a smear of moonlight on a distant ridgeline. This strangely singular memory, sharp as talons, returning to me now. Why? I patted this earth for thousands of years, sunk deep into the beast, human memories fading, fading, gone. And yet, this vision of the wolf awakening all within me. I am Treach, memories returning in full flood, even as my body grows cold, so very cold. He tracked the mysterious beast for days, driven by relentless curiosity, a scent unknown to him, a swirling wake of death and old blood. Fearless, he'd thought only of delivering destruction, as he had done without challenge for so long. Rillandaris had vanished into the mists centuries past, dead, or if not dead, then as good as. Treach had driven him from a ledge, sent him spinning and writhing down into the fathomless crevasse. No enemies worthy of the name since then. The tiger's arrogance was legendary. It had not been difficult, embracing such a surety. The four Kachin Chamal hunters had circled back, awaited him with cold intent. He thought, I tore into them, slashed flesh, shattered bones. I dragged one down, fangs deep in its lifeless neck. Another moment, another heartbeat, and there would have been but three. So close a thing. Treach lay dying from a dozen mortal wounds. Indeed, he should have been dead already, yet he clung on, with blind, bestial determination, fueled by rage. The four Kachin Chamal had left him, contemptuously, knowing he would not rise again and immune to mercy. So even a first hero is no match for these Kachin Chamal. My impression of a first hero has always been a soul taken or divers of immense power. Yeah, that's always been my impression too. And the power level of the soul taken that we've seen, I don't see a Kachin Chamal. I know they're pretty tough hombres, but I don't see them taking down any of the soul taken ascendants I can think of, but we've not been introduced to a whole lot of them either. So I'm still left with a question. I don't, we kind of pondered it a little bit an episode back, and it's like, uh, are first heroes ascendants? Is it a stepping stone to ascendancy? It's just, it's just another vague term that we don't really know. It's just kind of out there, just kind of some weird assignation to it, you know? The way I look at it, anybody that has lived as long as these guys have lived, they're ascendants. Okay. You don't get to live outside of a normal lifetime unless you're a mage or an ascendant or something. Okay. Normal humans, or I guess let's keep it to humans. Normal humans in this world seem to have a, a standard lifespan, unless it's yeah. prolonged by magic of some kind. Or right. Kalor has his sentry candles or whatever he's using. Mm -hmm. Prone on the grasses, Treach had watched with dulled eyes as the creatures padded away, noted with satisfaction as an arm of one of them, dangling from the thinnest strip of skin, finally parted and fell to the ground, to be left behind with utter indifference. 
Then, as the undead hunters reached the crest of a nearby hill, his eyes had flashed. A sleek, long black shape flowed from the grasses, was among his slayers. Power flowed like black water. The first Kachain Shamal withered beneath the onslaught. The clash descended beyond the crest, beyond Treach's line of sight. Yet, dimly heard past the deafening thunder of his waning life, the battle continued. He began dragging himself forward, inch by inch. Within moments, all sounds from the other side of the hill fell away. Yet Treach struggled on, his blood a slick trail behind him, his eyes fixed on the crest, his will to live reduced to something bestial, something that refused to recognize an end to its life. He thought, I have seen this. Antelope, veteran, the willful denial, the pointless struggle, efforts to escape, even as throat gushes blood to fill my mouth, limbs kicking in the illusion of running, of fleeing, even as I begin feeding. I have seen this, and now understand it. The tiger is humbled by memories of prey. He forgot the reason for the struggle to reach the crest, knew only that he must achieve it, a final ascent, to see what lay beyond. He thought, what lay beyond, yes, a sun low on the horizon, the endless sweep of unbroken, untamed prairie, a final vision of wildness before I slink through Hood's cursed gates. She appeared before him, sleek and muscled and smooth-skinned, a woman, small yet not frail, the fur of a panther on her shoulders her long black hair unkempt yet gleaming in the day's dying light, almond-shaped eyes, amber like his own, heart-shaped face, robustly featured. She took out all those Kachin Chamal. That's it. Panthers are superior to tigers. Absolutely agreed. That is too funny. I love it. <laughs> you wouldn't think it, but I guess the proof's in the pudding. Yes, well, she'll be described later too. Right, right. So it also explains a bit. Treach thought, Coarse queen, why does this sight of you break my heart? She approached, settled down to lift his massive head, rested against her lap. Small hands stroked the blood and dried froth from around his eyes. In the language of the First Empire, she said, They are destroyed. Not so difficult. You left them with little, silent hunter. Indeed, they veritably flew apart from my softest touch. He thought, liar. So I guess he loosened the lid on the jar for her. I think she's just being sweet to him as he's laying here, maybe dying. But uh -huh. First Empire, so she's true First Empire. Is she calling him from the First Empire that took their name from this land I'm as? Yeah. Do we get to that later in this section here? I think so. Something will come up. I'm just asking you. I mean, I think that's a differentiation between one and the other. Oh, yeah, that does come later. I'm sorry, you're right. Yeah. But to answer your question, she's using his own language from the First yeah. Empire, which was that civilization in Seven Cities. Yes. The knockoff. <laughs> she smiled and said, I have crossed your wake before, Treach, yet would not approach, recalling your rage when we destroyed your empire so long ago. He thought, it has long cooled, I'm ass. You did only what was necessary. You mended the wounds. She said, the IMAS cannot take credit for that. Others were involved in the task of repairing the shattered Warren. We did nothing but slay your kind, those whom we could find, that is. It is our singular skill. Treach thought killing. She said, yes, killing. He thought, I cannot return to my human form. I cannot find it within myself. She said, it has been too long, Treach. He thought, now I die. She said, yes, I have no skills in healing. Within his mind, he smiled then thought, no, only killing. She said, only killing. He thought, then an end to my suffering, please. She said, that is the man speaking. The beast would never ask such a thing. Where's your defiance, Treach? Where's your cunning? He thought, do you mock me? She said, no, I am here, as are you. Tell me, who then is this other presence? He thought, other? She asked, who has unchained your memories, Treach? Who has returned you to yourself? For centuries you were a beast, with a beast's mind. Once that place is reached, there is no return. Yet, he thought, yet I am here. And this goes back to what Quick Ben said to Picker earlier in the book. The current perception is that Treach has lost himself and doesn't know himself anymore. Right. Well, that explains an awful lot. You remember when he was criticizing her for getting those torques from Treach? <laughs> yeah. She said, when your life fades from this world, Treach, I suspect you will find yourself, not before Hood's gates, but elsewhere. I can offer nothing of certainty but I have sensed the stirrings. An elder god is active once again, perhaps the most ancient one of all. Subtle moves are being made. Select mortals have been chosen and are being shaped. Why? What does this elder god seek? I know not, but I believe it is an answer to a grave and vast threat. I believe the game that has begun will take a long time in its playing out. He thought, a new war? She said, are you not the tiger of summer? A war in which this elder god has judged you will be needed. 
Wry amusement flooded Treach's mind. He thought, I have never been needed, I'm ass. She said, changes have come, upon us all, it seems. He thought, ah, then we shall meet again? I would wish it. I would see you, once more, as the Midnight Panther. She laughed, low in her throat, then said, and so the beast awakens. Farewell, Treach. She had, in that last moment, seen what he only now felt. Darkness closed around him, narrowed his world. Vision, from two eyes to one. One, looking across a stretch of grasses as night fell, watching the massive soul-taken tiger pause warily above the dead bull Ranag upon which it had been feeding, seeing the twin flares of its cold, challenging glare, all so long ago now. Then nothing. A gloved hand slapped him hard. Groggily, Tok pried open his lone eye, found himself staring up at Senu's painted mask. Tok said, uh... Senu tonelessly said, an odd time to fall asleep, then straightened and moved away. The air was sweet with the smell of roasting meat. Groaning, Tok rolled over, then slowly sat up. Echoes rolled through him, ineffable sadness, half-formed regrets, and the long exhalation of a final breath. He thought, gods, no more visions, please. Yeah, this would take quite a toll on anyone that had to endure repeated visions like that. I can't imagine what that would be like. Hey, we learned that from Leto Atreides II. <laughs> All that spice visions, man, it's hard stuff. Yeah. You don't need to be messing around with that stuff. No, dude. All whacked out of your head, not in your control of having people forcing things upon you visually and mentally and spiritually. It's like, dude, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, I don't love that. Yeah, I wouldn't love that either. Tox struggled to clear his head as he looked around. Tool and Balejag had not moved from their stance of before, both staring northward, motionless, and Tok eventually realized, taut with tension, and he thought he knew why. He said, she's not far off, coming fast. He thought, with the night flowing as the sun flees, deadly majesty, ancient, so very ancient eyes. Tool turned and asked, what have you seen, Errol Fail? To where did you journey? Tok clambered weakly upright, then said, Beru Fend, I'm hungry. Hungry enough to eat that antelope raw. He paused, drew a deep breath, and said, What have I seen? I was witness, Talani Mass, to the death of Treach, Trake as he's known round here, the Tiger of Summer. Where? North of here. Not far. And no, I don't know why. Tool was silent for a moment, then he simply nodded and said, Chen Re Aral Lich Fail, the men here, heart of memory. He swung round again as Baljag rose suddenly, hackles rising. The panther that Tok knew was coming finally appeared, more than twice a man's height in length, eyes almost level with Tok's own, her sleek fur blue-black and shimmering. A scent of spice swept forward like an exhaled breath, and the creature began assembling, the shift in uncertain blurring, a folding in of darkness itself. Then a small woman stood before them, her eyes on Tool. She said, Hello, brother. Tool slowly nodded, then said, Sister. What? <laughs> What a reveal that is. Yeah, big time reveal. Also, the sheer size of her panther form, 10 to 12 feet long and 5 to 6 feet tall at the shoulder. That's just crazy. <laughs> That's a big double wow. But here's another fact. If it's her brother, she appears to be a woman still. Yes. Tool mentioned this. His sister refused the vow. Okay. I didn't know if we got, I, I couldn't remember if we covered that. Okay, thank you. Yes. But how is she still alive? That's a good question. Obviously an ascendant. Yeah, gotta be. She said, you've not aged well, as she lithely stepped forward. Baljag backed away. Tool said, you have. Her smile transformed bold features into a thing of beauty. She said, generous of you, Onos. You have a mortal A for a companion, I see. Tool said, as mortal as you, Kilava Onas. Kilava said, indeed? Predictably shy of my kind, of course. Nonetheless, an admirable beast. She held out a hand. Baljag edged closer. She said, I'm ass. Yes, but flesh and blood, like you. Do you remember now? Baljag ducked her head and padded up to Kalava, leaned a shoulder into hers, who pressed her face into the animal's mane, drew deep the scent, then sighed. She whispered, this is an unexpected gift. If the scent of an unwashed dog is a gift, then I question her sanity. <laughs> I agree, kind of, but it's, it's like they say, wh whoever they is, I don't know, just the every ubiquitous they, um, they say that mm. smell is the biggest memory trigger. So in this particular instance, I can imagine that would be a gift for her, though. I agree. Having not smelled one in hundreds of thousands of years, probably. Yeah, that's a good point. There are some fragrances that I hadn't smelled in like 20 years, and I smelled one recently, and it took me back right to high school. Oh, wow. It's amazing how strong the memory is linked to the smell. Yeah. 
Yeah, big time. What was the one from Anchorman? Oda Panther? I don't know. I've never Got seen bits that. of real Panther in it. You, you don't remember that? I've never seen it. you never seen Anchorman? Mm -mm. You're missing out. Talk said, more than that. He twisted inside as she looked up at him. He thought, the I mass as they once were before the ritual, as they would have remained if, like her, they had refused its power. A moment later, those eyes narrowed. Talk nodded. She said, I saw you, looking out from Treach's eyes. Talk asked, both eyes? She smiled and said, no, only the one you no longer have, mortal. I would know what the Elder God has planned for us. Talk shook his head and said, I don't know. I can't recall ever meeting him, alas. Not even a whisper in my ear. Kalava asked, Brother Onos, who is this mortal? Tool said, I have named him Aral Fail, sister. She said, and you have given him weapons of stone. Tool said, I have, unintended. She said, by you, perhaps. Tool growled, I serve no god. Her eyes flashed and she said, and I do? These steps are not our own, Onos. Who would dare manipulate us? An IMS bonecaster and the first sword of the Talan IMS, prodded this way and that. He risks our wrath. Tool sighed, enough. You and I are not of a kind, sister. We have never walked in step. I travel to the second gathering. She sneered and asked, think you I did not hear the summons? Tool asked, made by whom? Do you know, Kilava? She said, no, nor do I care. I shall not attend. Tool cocked his head and asked, then why are you here? She said, that is my business. Talk thought, she seeks redress. The realization flooded Talk's mind, and he knew that the knowledge was not his, but an elder god's, who now spoke directly in a voice that trickled like sand into Talk's thoughts. The voice said, to right an old wrong, heal an old scar. You shall cross paths again. It is, however, of little consequence. It is the final meeting that concerns me, and that will be years away in all likelihood. Ah, but I reveal unworthy impatience. Mortal, the children of the Panion Seer are suffering. You must find a way to release them. It is difficult, a risk beyond imagining, but I must send you into the Seer's embrace. I do not think you will forgive me. Struggling, Talk pushed his question forward in his mind. Release them? Why? The voice said, an odd question, mortal. I speak of compassion. There are gifts unimagined in such efforts. A man who dreams has shown me this, and indeed, you shall soon see for yourself such gifts. Talk said compassion, mentally jarred by the Elder Guard's sudden departure. He blinked and saw that Tool and Kalava were staring at him. Her face had paled. Tool said, my sister knows nothing of compassion. Talk stared at Tool, trying to retrieve what had been spoken last, before the visitation. He could not recall. Kilava said, Brother Onos, you should have realized it by now. All things change. Studying talk once more, she gave him a sorrowful smile and said, I leave now. Tool stepped forward and said, Kilava, the ritual that sundered you from your kin, the breaking of blood ties, the second gathering, perhaps. Her expression softened. She said, Dear brother, the summoner cares nothing for me. My ancient crime will not be undone. Moreover, I suspect that what will await you at the second gathering will not be as you imagine. But I, I thank you, Onos, Tulan for the kind thought. Tool whispered, I said, we do not travel in step, struggling with each word. He went on, I was angry, sister, but it is an old anger. Kilava. She said, old anger, yes, but you were right, nonetheless. We have never walked in step with each other. Our past ever dogs our trail. Perhaps someday we will mend our shared wounds, brother. This meeting has given me hope. She briefly laid a hand on Balejag's head, then turned away. Talk watched her vanish into the dusk's shroud. Another clattering of bones within leather skin made him swing round, to see Tool on his knees, head hung. There could be no tears from a corpse, yet. Talk hesitated, then strode to Tool and said, There was untruth in your words, Tool. Swords hissed out, and Talk spun to see Senu and Thirul advancing on him. Tool snapped out a hand and said, Stop! Sheathe your weapon, Segula. I am immune to insults, even those delivered by one I would call a friend. Man, those boys were ready to defend his honor. You see how fast they responded? Oh, yeah. Was it calling your mod, Hart? <laughs> <laughs> In reference to a certain caravan being referred to as a Tart's mobile palace. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure it's periwinkle blue. <laughs> oh. Talk said, not an insult, an observation. What did you call it? The breaking of blood ties. He laid a hand on Tool's shoulder and went on. It's clear to me, for what that's worth, that the breaking failed. The blood ties remain. Perhaps you could take heart in that, Onos Tulan. Tool's head tilted up, withered sockets revealed beneath the bone shelf in the helm. Talk thought, gods, I look and see nothing. He looks and sees, what? Talk the younger struggled to think of what to do, what to say next. As the moment stretched, he shrugged, offered his hand. 
To his amazement, Tool grasped it and was lifted upright, though Tot grunted with the effort, his every muscle protesting. He thought, Hood, take me. That's the heaviest sack of bones I've... Never mind. <laughs> That's crazy that he's that heavy. He must be basically made out of stone now if he weighs that much. Yeah, yeah, petrified. <laughs> Maybe he's been petrified. Senu broke the silence, his tone firm. He said, stone blade and stone arrow, attend. The meal awaits us. Talk thought, now how in Hood's name did I earn all this? Ono's tool land, and respect from a segula, no less. In a night of wonders, that one surely takes the crown. And that is impressive. Senu spoke to talk. Yeah. Wow. I almost get kind of choked up there in some of this conversation with them. Yeah. It's a touching moment. With the parting of, uh, with, with Kalava and, and talk, I, I didn't throw her in the mix either. <laughs> or Trey. Or Tra- oh yeah. It's, it's one All of the, the people. Yes. The ever growing list of party attendees. It's like one of those high school parties that got out of hand. Oh yeah. People keep showing up. <laughs> yeah. And people, you know, it's like, these are people that are hard on the real estate kind of folks. Uh-huh. At Talk's side, Tool said, I have truly known but two mortal humans, both underestimated themselves, the first one fatally so. This night, friend Errol Fail, I shall endeavor to tell you of the fall of adjunct Lorne, Talk Riley said, immoral to the tale, no doubt. Tool said, indeed. Talk quipped, and here I was planning to spend the night tossing bones with Senu and Thirul. Senu snapped, come and eat, Stone Arrow. Talk thought, "Uh uh-oh, I think I just overstepped the familiarity thing. We're going to stop here this week, and we'll finish out the chapter next week. For standout moments, the way the Grey Swords recruit responded to the battle she just went through. I was incredibly impressed with that. Dude, very impressed she leveled up. Resilience plus one. Yes. Finding out that the word panion is a Jagoot word. That was quite the dun, dun, dun moment. Yeah, very. Man, this whole chapter is just dun, dun, dun. I mean, it's just all over. <laughs> just wow. Yeah, that's the first one. <laughs> uh, oh, the first, okay. Uh, of, yeah. of this episode. Of this episode. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There were a couple of them. Yeah. Tool giving talk a Talan I mass name. To your point earlier about their growing friendship, I think this is definitely signifying that oh man well the, him, him spotting that sense of despair out of him out of a supposedly dead thing that's kind of new i mean this is this wow that bond is growing that's cool talks dream encounter with bail jag that was pretty cool that he got to see some of her background memories yeah this yeah talks whatever's going on with him is very intriguing i'll tell you what for the moment It's kind of a real deus ex machina. It's kind of given us, as far as the info department goes, it's really, really helpful. (laughs) Yeah. Treach's dream coming to talk, all the details we learned regarding the first empire in that section. There's a lot of info drop there. Big time info drop. I always like finding out, if a book is well written and has good prehistory in it, that's intriguing and it's been alluded to. It's great to see it filled in. And my word, he fills it in so amazingly, dude. It's like, oh, and he's so, he's so not, he's not liberal with it at all. He's just so sparingly drops it. But when, I, when he drops those crumbs, boy, I just lap it up as quick as I can. It's great. Kalava killing the four Kachin Chamal that took out Treach. Mm. Very impressive power. It seemed pretty effortless almost. It's, it's all off screen. She didn't take any injuries. Covered, no. She was covered in some blood, maybe a little bit. <laughs> Somebody else's blood. Some, I'm sorry, something else's blood. I imagine she'd come out all dusty. Because <laughs> <You know, like, laughs> oh, they're dead. Maybe so. Yeah, right. right. Well, but wait, was, were they, but were those Kachay and Jamal dead? Because it was a memory. No, it was happening right now. That happened oh. real time in sync with the current time. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Even more awesome. Sweet. And then finding out that Kalava is Tool's sister in their reunion, Dude, though it was kind of sad a little bit. It is kind of sad. It's very touching in the fact that he was kind of even insinuating, it's like, man, you know, come on, maybe they'll forgive you whatever's going on. Maybe we can all kind of be together again. And that, that was very, very touching. Yeah, I appreciated how he reached out to her to try and reconcile. Yeah, yeah. And then upon that failing, seeing the emotion from Tool and talk, trying to uplift him. Yeah. I thought that was really touching. Yeah, the stuff with talk and tool is very core for me. It always has been. I latched onto it immediately because I think I like talk's very self-deprecating humor about himself, and he does underestimate himself. And I like this. When you talk about your unusual friendship, 
Maybe it's just because Tool is awakening again in some way. Because he mentioned the at the very end there, he mentions you know about the only two mortals he's ever known or people that we both know or have known. Right. You know, Lorne and Talk. It's like, wow. To me, that's kind of like, oh, he's going to tell you about it. So he's like, Tool's, I like him, man. He's, he, I, I'm looking forward to more of him and Talk, seeing what's going on with him. Agreed. And then finally, Tool telling Talk that he's underestimating himself. Yeah. But again, I kind of hit that a little bit there too. He is underestimating himself, and it is again, again, his core. Love this stuff. Love their bonding. Even the bonding with the Segula is very unusual and kind of cool. Oh yeah, that was great. Them recognizing talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was awesome. Oh, yeah, great stuff, dude. All right, great job tonight, Billy. Hey, great job, brother. Great job. You got any final thoughts before we drop off here? Just an amazing chapter so far, man. Both episodes of this chapter have just been relentless it keeps adding and adding and i cannot get over the straight up magnitude of this convergence this towards everything and like i said earlier we well, needed the last two books just to get your heads in the right frame of mind to understand not just what's going on here but the power levels at play here thank you for listing out all the forces that are converging here the oh. ever-growing <laughs> list of party <laughs> attendees you're welcome Al. it's kind of handy to know because that's a lot of folks <laughs> It is. Did you include Krupp in there? In the I did not. State Council? I can't remember. I did okay. not. I did not. I forgot the wondrous Krupp. So yeah. <laughs> the yeah, wondrous he'll bring, Krupp. He'll bring, he'll, he'll, bring, he'll bring you something. The garbage disposal. <laughs> he'll suck down all that food. <laughs> well, he does something, man. He's the best info gatherer of the bunch, isn't he? Yeah. So it's a, I'm intrigued. Info hoarder. <laughs> yeah, yes. He doesn't share. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. See you all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us. And we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com. Thank mm-hmm. you.